I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going and again, thanks for listening. Welcome back Streetwalkers. This episode is with Adrian Picardi. Adrian is a writer, editor, and director, also known as a filmmaker. In this episode, we talk about where Adrian grew up and what got him into filmmaking. We talk about some of the projects that he got into and has made. We also talk about his time and experience working on his very first professional film shoot. Plus, we talk about some of the projects he has coming up. This is director and filmmaker Adrian Picardi. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Adrian Picardi. How are you doing, Adrian? And am I saying your name right? You are saying my name correctly. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It is absolutely my pleasure. Yeah, man. So, well, first, I just want to say that the way that I found you is, I guess we have a mutual friend who is an author named Scott Sigler. Yes. And you did some work with him, and I'm sure you guys are friends from that now because... He's super awesome, and you seem pretty affable, so there's no way y'all don't still talk to each other. Oh, dude, yeah, he's awesome. Fantastic writer, and he has an insane work ethic, like the craziest work ethic I've ever seen anyone have. So, yeah, he he is a a really fantastic person. We're actually working on something right now. He's pretty dope. Yeah. I I stumbled across him, I want to say it was 2009, 2008 or 2009, He was releasing his uh, books as podcasts uh, all the way back then. So like before any podcaster you've ever heard of, he was dropping chapters in podcast form. And I'm proud to say that I have been in one or two of his books. So I'm pretty proud of that. I am a football player in the future. (laughs) Oh, nice. Okay. But uh, we're not here to talk about the cool Scott Sigler. We're here to talk about the even cooler Adrian Picardi. <laughs> Where did you grow up, Adrian? I grew up in South Pasadena, California. It was so sheltering. It's like Pleasantville in a weird way. Really? It, that, at least that's from my perspective. Like growing up, I just felt like it was a safe community. Everyone there was nice. Like everyone at school for the most part, like there was Like in high school, there was barely any bullying. At least I didn't experience much bullying. Everyone was just very nice. And it was a very quaint and nice town. Like they actually shoot a lot of films in South Pasadena. Like I grew up on a street where they filmed a ton of movies on. I remember Adam Sandler was shooting The Animal with Rob Schneider on my street. And I would like, I I knew who Adam Sandler was. I didn't really know who Rob Schneider was, but I was like, holy shit, what are they they doing? And sure enough, they're shooting another movie. Uh, They shot, like, Back to the Future in South Pass. They shot Mr. and Mrs. Smith in South Pass. Good Lord. Yeah, dude. Like, I kind of, like, I I make a joke of it. I'm like, fuck, I can't run away from this industry. Like, it's just, like, even going home, you know, it's like, oh, shit, the street's blocked. I can't fucking drive down that street now because they're they're shooting something. But, no, that's where I grew up. I grew up in South Pass. That's so funny. Last Wednesday, um, I was meeting a, a buddy of mine for coffee before I hopped a plane back to San Antonio. It was in L.A. somewhere. And uh, we we walked into this place because, you know, I was like, where do you want to meet for coffee? He was like, oh, how about this place over here? They have great coffee. And I was like, sure. So I just, you know, just Google Maps it or whatever. And then I get there and there's like all these dudes in the parking lot. And this is at like at 555 in the morning. And there's all these dudes in the parking lot and I pull in and I'm looking for a place to park. And this dude rolls up and he's like, hey, you can't park here. And I was like, well. It's a giant empty parking lot. Like, like <laughs> this is like at a grocery store, you know, like it's huge. Right, right. I go, I can't park here or I can't park there. He goes, you can't park anywhere here. <laughs> I was like, uh, that's weird. So I went and parked on the street and then my friend showed up and I was like, y- we can't park here or whatever. So we both parked the street and we went in to get coffee. And my buddy was like, um, what are you, what's going on? Like, 
what is happening? And the dude was like, oh, they're filming here again. And I just thought it was so funny because the guy that I was with is an actor. And even he didn't know that that's what was happening. (laughs) Oh, my God. I mean, it makes sense for me because I'm in San Antonio. But, you know, he's there. He's in the biz. He should have known what was up. You would be surprised. Like, I had a friend in film school. And he's like, you know what? The craziest shit just happened to me. And we're like, what happened? Like I was walking out of the metro station so I can get to, you know, to class. And as I was walking, I noticed that the streets were a little bit like quiet. And as he was walking out of nowhere, this huge crowd comes running, screaming, and like sand just started like rushing towards him. And he freaked out. He's like, dude, I thought it was a terrorist attack. And after everyone's screaming and shouting and panicking, and, and I just ran with the crowd, you know, because that's naturally that's what you should probably do. He hears like someone yell, all right, cut. <laughs> They're like filming Spider-Man. He somehow accidentally like walked onto a live set where they were doing like some kind, I wouldn't say it's a stunt, but it was like some kind of intense scene. And he got caught in the middle of this. And I thought that is fucking so hilarious. hilarious. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, dude, that's so hilarious. Yeah. I heard a story about, oh, what's that guy's name? The guy who plays Machete? Mm. Danny Trejo. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I heard him tell a story once about um, before he was an actor when he was just a, a hoodlum. Yeah, he was. Ru- he had done something, and he was like on foot, like running from the cops. And he <laughs> rounded a corner. He rounded a corner, and there was a set, and he just blended into the the background actors or whatever. Oh my god! That is <laughs> and 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 he evaded the police. No that way. Time. I mean, he went to he went to prison later, but he <laughs> evaded the police that time, and so that was when it put the seed in him that hey, I should start acting. Well, yeah, well, but the thing was, was after the police were gone, and everything he just sort of hung out with those extras, and then at the end of the day, they like cut him a check. <laughs> no shit, shut. Yeah, oh my it was God, you know like freaking hilarious. fifty bucks or whatever it was. And whatever, he man. Was, he got away from the cops, and he got. Paid. And correct. And so that's when he was like, uh, this isn't so hard. Maybe I should do this shit. <laughs> oh, I love that. That is hilarious. Isn't that awesome? Think, yeah, dude, that's aw- Yeah, that's more than awesome. I mean, dude, you, you, <laughs> he, he escaped the police and then someone gave him a paycheck. Like, yeah, here. Isn't that yeah, fun? For- and, and a career. And a career. Yeah, exactly. And a career and a taco shop or whatever I isn't think that I, that just fucking blew me away I, I, i'll yeah. never forget that story it's just so awesome that is awesome so a little birdie told me that i think you were like 19 or something when you went to film school yeah so i was a terrible student in high school oh no wait you graduated film school at 19 i graduated at 19 so yeah i was a terrible Holy student shit. in high school no, it wasn't like I was smart and I went to some like university. I went to Los Angeles Film School, which is like a one-year program. It's like, I don't want to talk badly about the program. I think it's great, but it's very intense. You need to kind of have some somewhat of a background with filmmaking because you just can't process everything that quickly and leave and go, yeah, I'm going to remember all of this. You know, like it was, I was at school from like 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. It was like sensory overload of just information, information, information. And by like 7 p.m., the students were just so exhausted. And then you go to like a Pro Tools class. And they're like, we're going to teach you Pro Tools. It's a brand new program. You guys have to press this button, do this, do this. And you can just see like the students are just like, fuck. I didn't mind it because I knew how to use Avid, uh, Avid Media Composer in high school. I taught myself how to use Avid. Why? Why? Because, I mean, I was that kid with the camera, right? Like, I was in high school. I wasn't a good student. For the first three years of high school, like, I I don't think I was the popular kid. I was kind of someone that just, like, disappeared into the crowd. And then I found a group of friends that was developed from my interest of learning to, like, oh, this medium, I can express myself. Like, I'm so shitty at expressing myself and, and how I feel. And I went through so much, like, trauma growing up. You know, when I found the camera, I was like, oh, I can express myself. It wasn't so much about like storytelling, but it was more about like getting all that like teenage angst out. And I remember like watching, I don't know if you're familiar with CKY, like, you know, the jackass guys, like they did CKY. Yeah. Like, you were, you, do you know what I'm talking about? Like CKY2K and CKY, Bam Margera. 
and all of his friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kid is roughly your age, so I'm familiar with those okay, kids. Okay, so he would totally know what that is. And, I mean, they were ahead of their time. That was like YouTube back then. You know what I mean? So, like, as a kid, I ate that up, and I loved how they filmed all of, like, the skateboarding scenes, and I was totally into the skate scene at that age. And I just begged my parents to no end to just get me a freaking camera. Like, I bothered them to the point where they're like, dude, this guy's not going to shut up unless we get him a freaking camera. And after like months of begging, they finally caved (laughs) and I got this camera and I became obsessed with filmmaking because it was a medium that allowed me to kind of express myself in a way that I just couldn't do with words. And I was a huge fan of Tony Scott growing up. Like I remember seeing Enemy of the State when I was like, in sixth grade and mind you i come from a family that were just so strict like they would not let me watch an r-rated movie ever like i think that was probably one of the first r no actually the first r-rated movie i ever saw was starship troopers and i was like holy shit this is freaking awesome i loved it but it wasn't like enough for me to go oh i kind of want to do take a stab at filmmaking it wasn't until i saw enemy of the state with will smith where I was like, holy crap, this feels different than anything I've seen. Because up until that point, I was just, you know, watching movies that my parents let me watch. (laughs) And those weren't like the greatest films, I would say. Like, we were on a plane ride to Italy, and I was on, I was sitting by myself, and they had this like TV or that display in front of you, and I can finally choose whatever movie I want to watch. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna watch this. And of course, they knew I did that, they would have been pissed, but I watched it anyways. And holy crap, I was blown away by just the energy that came off how old were you i was 11 12 you were 11 or 12 the first time you got to choose your own movie yeah (laughs) yeah dude yeah yeah eat it up yeah it's dude it sucked i mean even with music man like that parental guidance or whatever that sign was remember that little like thing i don't even know if they have that anymore but it was like parental supervision or something like that that black and white symbol dude if that was on there there they're they're like, yeah, yeah, you're not, no, 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 please, no. Here, how about you listen to my ABBA albums? Or here, you like Shiana Twain? Sweet. Like, Yeah, I'm just like, oh, God damn it, mom, dad, you're killing me. Like, my dad, like, just listened to, like, the most eclectic, like, I mean, I, I actually enjoyed the music he listened to. Like, he listened to, like, Gypsy Kings and whatnot, but it wasn't, like, my time. The Gypsy Kings? No shit. Yeah, Gypsy Kings is a shit. I, I like the Gypsy Kings. Wow, that's awesome. Anyway, yeah, so going back to, like, watching Enemy of the State, like, the final, like, moment in that film where I forgot, like, what happens. I I don't really remember exactly what happens at this point, but I know, like, Will Smith goes in undercover and there's, like, this whole shootout. But the way it was shot, like, for some reason, I gravitated toward that. And then from there, like, having this camera, I started, like, watching my favorite films. And obviously, by that point, when I was in, like, high school – they didn't give a shit what I did. <laughs> and I was watching like all kinds of movies and like, like, you know, watched a bunch of like Guy Ritchie movies, like Snatch and Lockstock and Two Smoke and Barrels and just all these movies that inspired me. And I would go out with my friends and we would film shit. And like, I wasn't terrible at it. Like, you, you know, I, I, even now I would like, if I were to like watch one of my students that I did back in high school, I mean, they were dog shit. They were terrible, but they at least had a, like some form of cohesion of style. Like visually, it was like, oh, I I can see inspiration here, you know? And from that, I I started like meeting new friends through that creation process. We would get together on weekends and they'd be like, oh, let's shoot this and let's all get together and write like a story and like come up with stuff. And it became a huge bonding experience for me. And the more I did it, the more I realized like going to a four-year university, which was my plan. I mean, my mom's Korean, so you can just imagine the amount of disappointment she had when I was like, yo, I don't want to go to USC. I don't want to become a doctor. I don't want to become a doctor. I want to go to film school. And she's like, what? But when she saw how I like lit up when we went to go visit the school, she became like so supportive. Both my parents, they, they saw how much I loved you know, the filmmaking process. And they were like, no, you've been doing this for years and you didn't get bored like we thought you would, like you do with most things. You know, like I have wicked ADD and I'm just like all over the place. They're like, it seems to me like this is something that you really like. And like they knew my grades were terrible. I mean, I think the school made a new rule because of 
the amount of times that I ditched school. Like my school had this thing where once you turn 18, you are allowed to write your own passes out of school. And once I figured that out, I was like, oh, I'm never coming here. Like I would go to this, the, the lady who took like those like notes, why you can't be in class. And she became almost like a friend. It's like, hey, like today I have to go to my dentist. She's like, all right, see you. <laughs> And like my, like one time I remember I went into uh, the nurse's office and I was like, I have to pretend like I'm not feeling good because I want to go to lunch with my buddy. And he finally, like he got his license. Like back then, like I remember, like I didn't get my license until I was 18. (laughs) I was a little bit late to the game on that. But I remember looking at the nurse and telling her that I didn't feel good. And then I, I looked through the window and his car just like recklessly pulls up and he's like waving at me to go. And I'm all, I'm like biting my tongue, trying not to laugh. I was such a bad, such a bad student, but my parents also knew that. And they're just like, look, if this is something that you're super interested in, then we support you. And I'm super grateful that they supported me. And I decided that going to a school that's going to bury me in crippling debt and also put me in a position where it's like uh, four years, five years, six years later, where I finally can like jump into the film industry. I was just like, that's probably not the best idea. And I actually talked to a teacher guy his name is Mr. Springfield he gave me some of the best advice I don't think he knows how amazing advice he gave to me at the time like I, I don't think he knows but for me it meant everything because I was just like yo dude what do I do I feel so scared like I don't know if this is something that I should jump into and take the risk like what if I fail and he just gave me a really good analogy and I'm not going to share it because it's a little bit personal for him I think so he, he basically said just dude go for your dreams. You're not going to regret it. I'm just like, all right, fuck it. (laughs) Why not? And I said, sure, I'm going to go to LA film school and I'm going to do this year curriculum. And then I'm going to jump into the film industry head first and see where it takes me. And my parents and my entire family, like we have zero connections in the film industry. So it literally felt and is an uphill battle because I went there and I graduated and it took me six months to find my first job in the business, in the business. Yeah. I remember like sitting down and going, I have debt that I need to pay off. I need to figure out how I'm going to get a job. And there's no textbook where I can pick up and just go, Oh, here are the ways you can find a job in the film industry. So I literally started call calling. I, I went online. I found a bunch of production companies uh, I started writing down their numbers and I was so nervous, man. Like, oh, it was so nerve wracking. Like, I was so nervous to pick up that phone and just be like, hey, I'm, I need a job. Like, I didn't know what to say, but I forced myself. I was like, I'm going to write down a list of numbers and every day I'm going to force myself to call two of these up. And that went on for like a month and I got zero, like no one hired me. And I just kept going and going and going. And the way I got my first job was I also looked at like Craigslist for jobs in the industry. And there was this one guy who was looking for an editor for his music video. And I was like, I need money. So I'll do anything. Sure. I'll edit your video. He's like, Oh, do you use final cut? I'm like, at the time I, I, I hated final cut. Cause it was always like final cut versus avid. Everyone who liked final cut, they were all Mac users. I'm a PC user. And Final Cut is like the user-friendly version of editing. Avid was like, it's pretty difficult to learn. I'm not going to lie. But I, I was like, I edit on Avid. And he's like, all right, well, my project's on Final Cut. I'm like, don't worry. Like, I will, I'll transfer. I know how to transfer all of your files onto Avid and we'll, we'll make it work. And I edited the shit out of his project. And he was like, whoa, dude, that was quick. And this is actually pretty good. He's like, Do you, I, I work at a... TV company and we're looking for editors. Do you want a job? And I'm like, Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I need a job. And he's like, all right, cool. Come down and we'll interview you and we'll see if you fit. And I went and I got the job, but they're like, by the way, the job is night shift. <laughs> oh, son of a bitch. I'm like 18 at the time. And all my friends are calling me up going, yo, we're going to go to this college party. This is crazy. I'm like, um, I'm going to work. <laughs> looking back, I'm so surprised at how resilient I was. Like you would think I would be kind of like sad or dead, but I was so grateful for that job. It made all those nights alone because there was only like one other person working there. He's like this really awkward Indian dude. And I I tried talking to him and he was just like, kind of leave me alone vibes. So I was just alone. 
go I remember I would go to like this Thai restaurant next door like at nine, ten at night and they were like always like about to close and I would just like eat on the sidewalk by myself. And then I would like get texts from my friends like saying, Hey, we're going to this party, do you wanna come? And I'm like, Nope, I'm working. And I did that for I think like three or four months and I made decent amount of money and that was so like I felt so grateful for that. I was just happy to be working. Even though it wasn't like the most glamorous job and I was just so grateful for that job. And slowly they're like, hey, do you want to move to day shift? I'm like, oh, thank God. I don't have to be a vampire anymore. And on the weekends, like while I was doing that, I'll take all the money that I made and I would start shooting my own stuff. And that's kind of how things started to unravel or in a good way, not a bad way. So then you started you started making your own films and, and I guess submitting to film festivals and whatnot? Yeah. So one of my student film actually got screened at Sundance in 2007. And I made decent enough, like I made some connections there, but like all of the schmoozing went on at bars and I couldn't legally get into a bar. So every time we got invited to after parties, I'm like, I can't go in. You know, I'm, eight, I'm, eight, I'm 18. So was that film his day to remember? Yes, yes, yeah, it, yeah. That was his day to remember. That was with my one of my best friends, Sonny, the Indian guy in that. He starred in like all of my high school <laughs> films. And he also kind of carried into the film industry. But yeah, so I got that film. It won some money from that that film festival. I think we got about like 10 grand. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, mean, yeah. Right. Like I used all of that money to buy film equipment. I was like, I'm going all in. Fuck it. (laughs) And I remember my dad going like, maybe you should save some of that. I'm like, no, I'm making enough money from this editing job. I'm going to buy a camera. And it was like the HVX 200. Back in the day, that was like the it camera. It can do slow motion for the first time, which is like 60 frames a second. But it was amazing at 720p. And I started filming these like, small teasers like for a story that was unfinished and I was just throwing them up on YouTube and then I get a call or a a message from this dude who's like hey I work at Ghost House Pictures I'm like holy shit okay I saw your your trailers and then now you now you're talking about the resistance right that's the name of your web series or whatever yeah okay and I was like okay they were like, do you want to come in for a meeting and talk about your project? And I was like, yes, <laughs> I do. And they're like, all right, can you come in tomorrow? I'm like, oh, shit, sure. And I so, remember- So, hold on. Did they just stumble across it? Like, they just happened to find it? Yeah, they just stumbled across it. Like, there wasn't, like, back then, YouTube wasn't really a place for, I mean, I guess it was, but it was mostly, like, people posting, like, vlogs or, you know, so- so this is when, like 2009 or something? I forgot. It's like that whole time period is, is, has now become a blur to me, and I'll explain why in a minute. But yeah, it was crazy that they stumbled upon it. So here I am at 19, and I go to this meeting, and I have no idea what to expect. And I make the mistake of pounding a freaking Red Bull before going into this meeting as if I wasn't nervous enough. <laughs> And I go into this meeting and I am like, my hands are shaking. I'm like, God damn it. Why did I drink that Red Bull? Like I thought like I was tired, but I thought it would give me energy, but it was like the worst combination. And I sit down and I have like, my mouth is dry. And of course, whenever you go to these meetings, they're like, Hey, would you like some water? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I would love some water. And I sit down and then everyone's staring at me they're like, so tell us about your project. And it's just like panic, you know, like fight or flight mode. And I'm just like, Oh my God, I'm going to vomit. <laughs> And I somehow like managed to come off somewhat cohesively <laughs> and and talk about this project. They were like, oh, okay, cool. They didn't look super impressed. And I'm like, but, but, but I have this whole packet. Like, I had this folder of like this comic book that I made for it. I mean, I, I was so passionate about this thing, labor of love. And I, I, I was so passionate and it, it, it was such a, interesting thing like how i i didn't plan for this to happen but i had like all the right elements in front of me to like really win them over and i gave them this like packet it was almost like an epk right like an electronic press kit or whatever and they opened it up 
and it just had like this booklet and it was just so well made that they were like, okay, we'll be in touch. And you did all of that yourself, right? No, you no, no. I, I did the majority of myself, but I, I met up with this producer friend who's still a great friend and he's absolutely killing it right now as a producer, but he was the producer for that project. He helped me out with another buddy of mine. It was just like this collaboration of friends. It wasn't like we were living in, in that world yet. We were still kind of outside. We were just like film students who just want a chance at the film industry. So we would hang out and we would just bullshit, but at the same time we'd be creating these like trailers and teasers and whatnot. But I, I got help from them but I designed most of it and, you know, they put in the money to print it out and get all the physical stuff together. And they're like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll be in touch. And then I get a phone call from stars, the TV channel. Yeah, they were, they were a co-production company. They were the main company behind the resistance and ghost house pictures was just providing two of their producers to help produce the project. So they, they, you know, they got a cut and they hit me up and they're like, Hey, we want to make your little web series. And I was just like, I felt like I was on top of the world and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> They're like, we're going to give you like 250,000, but that's not all going to go to screen. Cause there's like, you know, the money needs to go in different places. And I was just so naive to like the entire process. And at the time, 250 K sounded like, dude, we're going to make like, you know, I had these really grandiose ideas and like what I wanted it to be. And I, I, you know, had no idea like how little, how quickly that money. Well, <laughs> and this was 10 years ago when that was, you know, kind of a bit more than it is now. It was probably like, uh, I don't know, like 320 or 330 in today's dollars. I do. I understand what you're saying, but it went so fast because I needed guidance and I feel like I didn't get proper guidance, unfortunately. On that show? I feel like you didn't also. Yeah. And I walked in and I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And it became like, hey, let's try to fit a square peg in a circle hole. And what are you, like 23 at this time or something like that? No, I was 21. Oh, Lord. My name is Phil Rossi. I'm the creator of the sci-fi horror experience, Crescent along with Eden, Harvey, and a whole lot of other scary stories. I was quiet for a while, but I'm here to let you know that I'm back and in a big way. 50 hours of all new podcasts are ready for download on demand, including my new book, The Trance, a gothic cyberpunk detective story. And let me tell you, this book has got fangs. So here's the deal. For less than a cup of coffee or a pint of beer, you can become my executive producer. You can play a key part in taking my words off the computer screen, onto the page, and into the airwaves. For more info, free podcasts, and to sign up to become a part of my next big story, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bill Rossi. Now turn out the lights and take a deep breath, because the story is about to begin. So while I was filming that, I find out that my dad has brain cancer. Oh, no. Yeah. So that high of, oh, this is going to be the best experience ever, suddenly got shifted to, holy shit, my dad's dying. Because he had a stroke while I was working at the editing place, and I, that's why I left. And I had to stay home with him and help him. My mom, uh, they weren't together. They were split. Such an amazing woman. Like She came back to take care of him. And I had to help out. It turned out like as time progressed and I was filming and doing all this stuff, it turned out to not be a stroke. And then I found out it wasn't a stroke and it was brain cancer around the time when we started production. And that's why I was saying earlier, that's when I kind of, that period of my life is just a blur because of what, what had happened. No kidding. I'm sorry, man. Yeah. I mean, well, thank you. <laughs> can I ask you this before you continue? Sure. Is your dad still with us? No, he's not. He passed away. I'm sorry about that, man. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I lost my mom um, 2013 to cancer, and uh, she was pretty young. She was 58. So oh, I, dude, I I feel you. I feel rough. you, my brother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, thank you. I really, I really appreciate that, man. It means a lot. And being at that age, and, you know, it, it was just really difficult for me to process, right? 
And at the same time, I was dealing with one of the most stressful productions in my life. And I felt like so much was riding on this project. So I just had to power through it somehow. And I remember just saying to myself, like, we'll, we'll concentrate on all this other bullshit. But when you're on set, that's all you're going to think about. Because if you don't, you're going to start falling into that, like, panic mode which happens a lot to like new filmmakers where they start filming and then their brain goes you have so much more to complete you're only on day one you start thinking of how much more and and you start to like feel like it's becoming this insurmountable task so you really have to like concentrate on small bite-sized like moments you know like today we're going to concentrate on this scene and you know going through the film industry and, and doing more projects, you start to really learn like what it means to be a director and like how to direct actors properly. I didn't have any of that at that time because <laughs> I was like relatively new, you know, this is not a good commercial for the Los Angeles film school. Oh yeah. Well, it wasn't the film school's fault. It sounds like there was a lot that they didn't do. They did. So I I've interviewed a lot of people who went to film school. Nothing like school can only teach you so much. The best experience is going to be from being on set. That's true, but film schools should prepare you for the real world. Like they don't even teach you like where to find an agent. No, they don't. It's it's no, they pretty don't. crazy. They don't teach you a lot of it, but they teach you the basics of like this is how you work a camera. This is like blocking. This is the one eighty degree like law. This is they teach you a lot of the practical things. So you're not mad at them? No, of course not. Oh, okay, I mean, good. I I had a great time. I had a very positive experience, but again, I came from a place where I understood a lot of the principles of filmmaking beforehand. I knew how to edit. I understood just basic cinematography. I understood like depth of field. I understood a lot of that stuff. If anything, that school helped me learn quicker because I can bypass all of like the basic stuff and I can just get to the stuff to hone in on my skills. But you know, it's not the school's fault. Honestly, like I still think the best way if anyone wants to get into filmmaking is not necessarily jumping into film school first because it's expensive, but go and intern, go on set, see what it's like, get some real world experience because that when you go to film school, eventually, if in fact you want to, you're going to be able to hone in on skills that you've kind of learned already. And it's going to click in your brain and it's going to stay with you. It's not like you're learning something new for the first time, you know? It's sort of like when you play a video game, like, you know, you play a video game for a while and then all of a sudden things unlock. Yes. You, you pick up a controller and you start playing a game and you're like, this is so hard. And then for some reason, the next day you pick it up again and you're like, wait, I kind of remember how to do this. And it becomes like second nature. Is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't mean like you unlock levels. I mean, you unlock something in your mind that makes it easier to understand what's supposed to be happening. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah totally get that. And that's exactly kind of like what it's like, but no, man, I I shot this project and I remember at the end, I was so exhausted. Like I lost so much weight. I was actually losing hair. So one of the producers was like, dude, are you balding (laughs) at 21? He's like, are you balding? I was like, I I was having, I started having a bald spot because I was so stressed out with my life. Now I've heard of a sympathetic pregnancy, but a sympathetic chemotherapy reaction. (laughs) I know that's a little bit of a dark joke, but uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it totally is. But no, no, it's it's hilarious. But no, it was caused by an a insurmountable amount of stress that I was enduring at the time. And rightfully so, man. Like having a parent that's about to die and tackling a project that you, you thought this is what you wanted. And it turned out to be a, just a complete like, I wouldn't say it was a disaster, but by the end of the shoot, we were shooting it like we were shooting our YouTube videos. We got hit with a windstorm, just nothing was going right, and we're behind schedule, and everyone's looking at this 21-year-old kid like, yo, what are we going to do? And I held it together. I'm like, fuck it. I'm just going to do what I know how to do best. And my buddy and I looked at each other and like, let's just get this done. And we did it. Was that Sunny? Yeah, Sunny and I looked at each other and Sunny, like, let's just do it. Sunny, is it Jane? Sunny Jane, yeah. Sunny right. Jane, yeah. Now, what were those two producers from Ghost House? What the hell were they doing during all this? I thought that was kind of what they were. That's what a producer does, right? It sort of holds your hand. Yeah, I don't want to. They did for the most part, but I think they too were kind of blindsided by your lack of experience. I wouldn't say it was my lack of experience. Honestly, like not to like talk myself up, but if I didn't have the amount of experience I did from shooting all of my own projects, dude, it would have been much worse. 
Like that project would have gone downhill quick, but I held it together and I got, and I knew that was one thing that I had. Like I knew how to work under pressure and I knew how to work when nothing was going right. And all I had was a camera, three guys, and like, you know, the actors in front of me, I knew how to structure an action sequence without like, that was one thing that I was really good at. Like I knew how to structure the action sequences without having any kind of like, like our first AD even was just like scratching his head by the time the wind storms hit. And we're like at the, we had to shoot this final action sequence and we had a bunch of extras running around and, you know, we had pyrotechnics going off. It was just, if I can go back and do it any differently, I would be like, you got to cut this thing in half, take a bite that you can chew and digest because I get that you want to be ambitious. And they, to be fair, they did warn me. Like the producers did warn me. They're like, this is too much and you're, you're thinking too big. But I was a little bit stubborn on that end. So I have to like take a lot of accountability on why it turned out the way it did because I was just so like, it needs to be this amazing thing because I had it in my head and it was really hard to let go. And that's something that I learned working in the film industry. Like you kind of learn, like you have to kill your babies sometimes. Do you think that you were trying so hard to impress them, like to show the industry that you were for real? Yeah, dude, this was like every student's or every young filmmaker's like wish, right? Like getting a chance to prove themselves on a quote unquote, like bigger level. It didn't turn out how I wanted it. The stories just didn't turn out how I wanted it. The effects definitely didn't like it. We got so fucked with the VFX. Like I was just like, really, this is like, you guys just sent this to India <laughs> And you had some low level like CGI company like work on these and I could have done this myself and we spent what ten grand, twenty grand on this. Wow. So what what ultimately happened with it? Did the did you finish it and the series aired? Well, it was supposed to be a web series, meaning it was supposed to be released on like YouTube and then they're like, Hey, we got a brilliant idea. Let's smash these together and turn it into a TV pilot. <laughs> and I was like, Wow. This wasn't, and I, I've seen so many projects go that route where they're like, it's supposed to be a web series, but let's turn it into a feature film. You know what I mean? So we can maybe sell it. And it's right. just like, no, like it's not going to work that way, dude. It was written to be a, a small show and they, they squashed it together and they sold it to sci-fi and sci-fi ended up uh, nationally airing it, which was freaking awesome. That was cool. Yeah. I was going to say, what was that like? It should have been cool, but it was like I was going through the worst period of my life. Like my dad was dying. He had like a few, like I think it was like a week left. And I've heard from certain people, they're like, oh, you were being so cocky at that screening because you weren't like smiling. I'm like, dude, you have no idea like what I was going through. <laughs> like I was going through the worst time of my life. Oh my gosh. I didn't give a shit about the screening, mind you. All I can think about was like, dude, my dad's dying. Right. Well, this is sort of a tough question, but. Did your dad get to see it? No, he didn't. Damn. No, he didn't. Yeah, man. <sighs> I'm it, sorry. It's rough. You know what's really rough? It's like I can't drink Hanson's tea. You know Hanson's tea? Those cans of tea. Sure. I remember when my dad, like he was not really responsive and he was really losing like consciousness, but he, he was really thirsty this one night and he told me, hey, can you bring me something to drink? So I said, sure. And... I was driving there and I, I was just kind of, I, I was going through a depression at the time. And I wasn't think? going as fast as I should have. Right. And I bought some of that tea. And when I got there, it was too late. Oh no. I left it next to him. I was like, hopefully he wakes up tomorrow and he can drink it. And then the next day is when he passed and I got back and it was still there. And that fucking destroyed me. Oh, Adrian. Oh my God. I'm so sorry, brother. Yeah, it was it was rough. It was definitely rough. But I then had to like put on this facade of being like, oh, I'm going to be strong for my mom because my mom was just like bent out of shape completely. And I didn't process anything. Like I just became super numb. And my girlfriend at the time, I mean, thank God for her. She really helped me get through that. And that was, uh, yeah, that was really rough. And then, you know, after that, it's like, okay, well, what's going to happen with the, the web series so they aired it as a pilot or they just aired it as a yeah i mean i i, I did not i i did not like that idea i was like dude this is this is gonna get ripped up on t like tv has a certain level of polish that you you should have i know it's a sci-fi channel i'm not talking shit about the sci-fi channel but 
even still, like I, I kind of like, like whenever I put anything out there in the world, like I always give it my 110% effort. Sure. And I feel like this project, unfortunately, just didn't represent that. And it wasn't anyone's fault. Like I take full accountability for it, you know, because I was also the editor and did the color correction and did the effects. I broke my back over that project. And they wanted to turn it into like this long form thing. I just wasn't crazy about it. I was like, oh, it's going to get ripped up. And I mean, it didn't do terrible, you know, but if anything, I learned a valuable, valuable lesson. Pick your projects very carefully and also pick the right people to be beside you because it is like filmmaking is like a battle. Like you're going to be in the trenches and there are going to be times where you're going to be tested. Like I shot this other this feature film called Rush with the guys over at Corridor and that was in uh, Detroit. We spent three months in Detroit. There's like this action shoot and I mean, it was so much fun in the beginning, but as we got near to the end, I mean, we were just like exhausted. You can just see it in our faces. We're we're pulling like like 13 hour days or something because the crew, they had to go home a certain time, union roles, they had to be home at a certain time, but because I was DPing it and they were directing it, we would have to get there way earlier, plan out the day. And then at the end, we would have to start figuring out what we're going to do tomorrow. So it was just the longest hours. And I remember I got super sick one night and we were in this underground tunnel and there was like this refugee camp that was built and I had like 102 fever and I haven't like really gotten enough sleep and I was just like a zombie. And I remember feeling like, damn, man, I feel like I'm in a, in a fucking war zone right now. Like literally, like these guys are walking around with like M16s and there's like Humvees underneath this like parking garage and it's just insane. So being beside people that are going to support you and you guys get along with, and you guys know that even through adversity, you'll be able to push through is something super crucial in the filmmaking process. Like you have to pick the right people to be beside you because if not, shit will unravel so quick. Now I'll cut this part out if the answer is no, but do you have those people at your side now? Eric is still a good friend of mine. He was one of the producers on The Resistance I was actually in Tulum with him when I talked to you. (laughs) I was in Mexico with him. Oh, cool. Yeah, so we're still great friends, you know. That's awesome. My other buddy, Don, like he ended up in Vietnam. I don't know what he's doing. (laughs) He's an interesting character. But that's like one thing about the film industry is you meet so many amazing people. And it's like summer camp, right? Like you meet them and you have such an amazing time. And then they just kind of disappear. They go about doing their own things until hopefully one day you run into them and they get on a project or whatnot. But every project like this miniature summer camp where you meet awesome people and you have these amazing bonding experiences. And then you just kind of go off and, you know, you do your own projects and everyone's doing their own thing. But yeah, I, I keep in touch with some people from that that project. But most of the people I, I, I don't, unfortunately. I actually ended up dating one of the actresses from that show. Of course you did, because it's Hollywood. Of course, that was like the most... <laughs> well, you did say uh, that you grew up on uh, uh, one of the streets where they filmed uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and uh, we know how that turned out. Oh, yeah, right? Jeez. Yeah, <laughs> tumultuous, to say the least. Like, uh, dude, ho- relationships in Hollywood just uh so difficult. That's why I don't... Da- I-, I made it a point to try and not to date anyone that works in this industry. Anymore. <laughs> Anymore, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some of the some of the projects that you have coming up, uh, just the stuff that you can talk about. Sure, yeah. A, a little birdie told me that you're working on two feature films right now? One feature film right now. And I was actually, yeah, it's funny, I was working on a commercial this December that uh, just happens all the time. Like you work on something, they say you got the job, and then, you know, for whatever reason, things fall through i feel like a big part of that was because i wasn't like here i was in norway (laughs) yeah that might have something to do with it yeah yeah i was working on that it was a i can say it now because it's out it was a mortal Kombat commercial and then uh right now i'm working on a project with scott which is a feature film that i don't want to talk too much about i actually have a phone call with one of the producers tomorrow morning to see what he says because we actually just turned in our first like outline okay well Again, I'll cut this out if I have to, but is it the present? Oh, no, no. That present was just a fun little film that I just wanted to do because I was just itching to shoot something. Like, if I don't shoot something for some time, I get, like, this itch where I'm just like, dude, I need to shoot something. (laughs) 
And I saw this contest where they're like, you need to use your cell phone. I'm like, oh, that would be amazing to be forced to use something that I'm not used to using to shoot cinema, if you will. And it was, you know, use your cell phone. And it was so much fun. Like I, I hit up Scott. I'm like, yo, there's this thing I want to do. I'm bored. I want to shoot something. And he's like, all right, I'll get a script out. Like, just give me the parameters. I'm like, okay, here's some of the vibes that I want. Here's kind of the idea. Me and my friends, we, we own a bar in downtown LA. And I was like, I have a bar. So what's it called? It was called Blue Jay. And that's actually where I have to go in a bit here. But I have to go check out this place because we actually had to close because we got hit with this dance permit thing. It was called Blue Jay Bar and Lounge. And I guess you need a fucking dance permit to have people to dance. I didn't know that. LA fucking sucks, dude. Fucking LA, man. <laughs> oh my God. So we had to close down and now we're rebranding. And now I have to go check out this place to see if I want to uh, sell my portion of the company. But I'm, I'm going to go check it out later today. But no, we owned that bar and it wasn't, it was just sitting there and it was closed because we couldn't open up for business. So I was like, Scott, we have this really sick looking bar. If we can write something that takes place in the bar and it's like moody and this and this and this. And he's like, all right, I'll get back to you. And since you're shooting it on a phone, I'm going to write it on a phone on, on my way. To, I forgot where he was going, but he was on a plane. And he's like, I'm going to write this on my phone. So he wrote the script on a cell phone, sent it to me. I'm like, all right, this works. This doesn't. Let's try to like tweak this. And I was like, dude, this guy's insane. Like I, I literally asked him for a, like an idea and a script like an hour ago. And here he is just throwing ideas at me. Like he's just this, and he has the craziest work ethic. I love the guy. And we came up with you know, the present. And I called my buddy Steve to see if he was busy and uh, we met up for dinner and he's such an awesome dude. He's just like, yeah, I'll come out for fun. Are you kidding me? I'd love to shoot something. So Steve Ogg came out and then my buddy Jordan, he was in a different short. Uh, I shot this short called Rot last year in February sometime. He was in that and I got him to come out and then one of my buddies helped me find the actress and Kelly came out and it's so nice to be on set with just the actors and no crew. We had like two people and that was the crew. It was just me, my buddy Carlos and the gaffer, Chris, who just came out to help because we just wanted to see what we can shoot with a cell phone. Like we were curious to see what we can do. And we shot that in like six hours, seven hours. And then we I, like, edited it and put it. Yeah. And we put it together in like a matter of like a few days. And then we just threw it up there. Now, where can I find it? Is that available anywhere? Oh, yeah, it's on my YouTube channel. You can find all my stuff on my YouTube channel. Okay, we're going to get to your social media handles before we end, but I, I definitely want to check that out. For sure. Now, I know that you you said you can't really talk about what the feature film you're working on. And is it with Scott? What do you mean with Scott? Like, is he writing it or is he in it? Does he have anything to do with this feature film that you're working on? Oh, yeah, yeah. he He's writing it. Oh, shit. Oh my God, I hope it's Ancestor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, Scott's right. Dude, Scott's amazing, man. He he comes up with the most insane ideas. And then I really like jog off of that with him. And then I'm like, what about this and this and this? And he's like, okay, I love that. I don't like that. And then we just keep going back and forth until we like find something that we feel is fresh, you know? I've been very apprehensive in shooting, like directing my first feature because of you know past experiences and also i just i feel like i know how much work goes into a feature film and i don't want to find myself halfway into the feature film going i hate this why am i doing this and i know i have like another year because when you call a cut in the last shot that's a wrap and that's a wrap that's not really a wrap for the director like you're gonna have to be in post for months and then you have to go to the sound design then you gotta it's it's a whole other like you know, months of your life. So I just want to make sure whatever I do, I love it so much that I'm going to, I know I will see it to the end because that's how I felt with the resistance. Like I loved it so much. It was such a passion project that there was so much emotion tied to it that I stuck with it, even though it was so much work. <laughs> and I've actually come very close to getting a feature off the ground. I actually wrote this one script and it actually got financed. And I backed out at the last moment because I read the script and I'm just like, I don't believe in this. I started to become much more aware of what works and what doesn't in a screenplay. And knowing that if your screenplay isn't a page turner, if you're reading it and you're kind of getting bored through pages, like you're not going to have a good movie. I don't care how amazing the cinematography looks or what the color correction or what the music can do. It's like you need to have a script that 
jumps off the page. Like that's your blueprint. And I read that script and I was just like, this isn't doing it. This is weak. These characters don't make sense. Their arcs don't make sense. Like, how am I going to give these characters directions when I don't even understand like their intent? Because their intent is kind of contradictory to their overall character arc. You know, like there's so many, there were so many issues that I just had to like back off. And my manager at the time got kind of pissed at me because <laughs> that's like a paycheck loss. Right. But I'm glad, I'm so glad I did that. Like, I'm so happy that I did that. And then from there, it's like I started working on, like I was doing a bunch of music videos. I was shooting a bunch of music videos. I was DPing a lot of stuff. But now I'm like, I, I really want to shoot something. And working with Scott has been so amazing. Like he has the craziest ideas. And at the end of the day, I told him, look, man, like if we're going to make a film that's this crazy, at the end of the day, we should definitely be able to have fun with it. So I'm excited. I'm super excited to see where this goes. Me too. Yeah, thanks. But yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. That's kick ass. Now, I know that I have kept you for sort of a long time tonight, but will you tell everybody where they can find you on social media and make sure to hit your YouTube channel and website if you have one? My Instagram, they can find me at Adrian underscore Picardi, P-I-C-A-R-D-I. Sometimes people think I say Bacardi, like when I'm on the phone with like customer service and stuff, like I always have to say it twice. It's not like the drink, Bacardi. <laughs> P-I-C-A-R-D-I, but you can find me on Instagram at that handle. And on YouTube, I just think it's Adrian Picardi. I think if you search me up, I think it'll pop up. I don't, I have a Twitter, but I don't do Twitter, man. Word. I'm so bad with social media, man. Like, I know I should be better and I should like. Do you know why you're so bad at social media? I feel like you're going to tell me. I am going to tell you. It's because you're too fucking busy actually creating content. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I would like to think that. I, I, I think maybe that's it. I don't know. That's what I'm going with. That works for me. I'll, I'll take it. Before we go, I do want to give just a nice little shout out. We recently lost a directing legend in John Singleton. Yes, yes. Yes, that guy yes. was amazing. His work will live on forever, and he will be missed. He was currently working on a lot of things, which I don't think that are going to see the light of day, which is a loss, another loss for all of us. That was a real, real big loss. Totally. Yeah, I mean, Boys in the Hood. I remember that movie like scared the crap out of me when I was like when I first saw it, and it was just so like visceral. And I remember it leaving a a, a huge impact on me. And yeah, it that's tough. Maybe whoever hears this hasn't delved into the John Singleton catalog and. If you're listening and you haven't, you need to. He has made some of the best films in the last 30 years. Yeah, man. It's a huge, huge loss for the filmmaking community. My heart goes out to him and his family. All right. Adrian Picardi, you have places to be. I thank you so very much for taking the time and letting me get to know you a little better and hanging out with us on Fascination Street. Definitely, man. I really appreciate you inviting me. I had a, I had a fun time, man. It was really nice talking to you. It was nice talking to you, too, and hopefully we can keep in touch. I was in L.A. last week, and were you in Mexico when I was in L.A.? I think that's what happened, yeah. I think that is what happened. Well, that would have been <laughs> cool. <laughs> next time you're here, hit me up. Maybe next time I will. How about that? Well, the next time you're out this way, like, you know, when you're at the Austin Film Festival winning all the awards, call up a brother and I'll come <laughs> hang out with you. Definitely, man. I'll take you up on that offer. All right, cool. Well, Adrian, again, thank you so much, man. You have a great rest of your night. Thank you, man. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. This is Steve Owens from Fascination Street Podcast here with a very important message. I'm awesome. I bet you thought I was going to say something else. But nope. What's important here is that I am awesome. I started this show because I truly believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear those stories. In the short time I've been doing this show, I've interviewed actors, directors, writers, inventors, podcasters, musicians, pro athletes, Olympic athletes, actual war heroes, even a Bond girl and a luthier, whatever the hell that is, and of course, regular people. From people who wanted to be stars but never gave it a real try, to big company CEOs and people who got to meet their favorite president. I love getting to meet and speak with people who have a story to tell. I feel like everyone does, and it's my job to get them to tell it. You never know who my next guest will be. An Academy Award-winning actor, a platinum-selling musician, or your own mother-in-law. But one thing is for certain, you will be fascinated by their story. 
So come take a walk with me down Fascination Street. You can find Fascination Street Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and of course, FascinationStreetPod.com. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street. Thank you.